and Kia. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn, Kia, and Mia for this opportunity to share our work. Thank you, Carolyn, for More Than a Single Story, which has become one of my favorite um, series to, to catch. I love the combinations, the pairings. And so when I was invited to, um, to curate a writer to writer, my list was so long that I really struggled. And then somehow, uh, I think Antonia and Tonio and I were about to have a meeting about something else. And I realized how well our work would pair and how much I've wanted to have a conversation with him for years. So I'm really excited that we're able to be here tonight. So welcome, Antonio. Welcome all of you to this conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm so enthusiastic and excited to be in conversation. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be a treat for me. Thank you. <laughs> so as you heard, Antonio is both an actor and also a writer for the stage, which doesn't always come in a pair like that. And then he also works as a program director at Penumbra Theater. And so I think, I think Antonio, you get to bring us this sort of full circle of what it means to be a theater professional in <laughs> our contemporary times. And your story is so different from mine because I came to theater from a childhood with a grandfather who was a storyteller. And so mm -hmm. I, I stumbled my way onto the stage telling stories and then began to be curious about what it might mean to not have to sneak and add the fiction into those stories, to let the fiction um, allow the story to unfold in the ways that the real life stories were never given the opportunity to. So mm -hmm. the first question that I have for you tonight is, um, why writing for the stage? Why acting? How did you come to this? Mm, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I always kind of wanted to be a magician. Um, <laughs> I, I'm kind of obsessive with magic um, and I'm very introverted. Um, and uh, the theater kind of provides the perfect medium to combine um, sleight of hand uh, magic and a sort of epic scope. Um, I think uh, magic and theater have kind of a lot in common with the kind of practicality of what it takes to put on a play and that kind of obsessive rehearsal processes that you have to undergo. Uh, same with the kind of practicality of pulling off some kind of illusion. You need to kind of know the nuts and bolts of the kind of story you're telling within a kind of uh, sleight of hand. Um, so that was kind of my first kind of artistic entry into writing and playwriting is kind of obsessively watching magicians kind of do their art and then me trying to kind of write poems and kind of do the same thing um, with the words and like shape-shifting, you know, with the kind of uh, linguistic um, craft of some sort. Um, and also just like, uh, I love kind of the um, uh, silliness that theater allows. Uh, it kind of magic and uh, wordplay kind of come hand, go hand in hand with the kind of childlike wonder of it all that you have to have. Um, uh, which was kind of a very fun for a kid to, to kind of nerd out on. Um, yeah, that, that, that was kind of my entry point. Um, for me, I'm very curious. You mentioned your grandfather being a storyteller. Um, what can you uh, say more about that? What was, what was that um, uh, entry point for you? Uh, maybe hearing your grandfather's stories or did your grandfather's stories uh, come to you and that kind of inspired more stories or what, what, what was that for you? Well, let me, I don't know if I can squeeze this into the camera or not, but this is my business card and it is actually um, 
I'm borderline obsessed with my grandfather. Th those are a series of images that I created of him in my MFA program. There are about 10,000 of them in total, and they are based on a photograph that sat on the mantle in my grandparents' home in which my grandfather had a very stern look. And if you knew my grandfather, he was a practical joker. He never did I ever look at him and he had a serious face, even in the most tragic of moments. And so in my graduate work, as I was learning to, to navigate with um, digital image manipulation, I wanted to make him smile. And it took me about 10,000 frames to get the perfect smile that looked like the smile that he had. And so as sort of a memory of that process, I put some of those images on my business cards, <laughs> just so I would remember that it's about legacy, it's about labor, it's about um, fixing the story, right? because that picture made it seem like he was this very stern person and that was not who he was. Um, as a kid, he he told all of the old um, standard stories. And then he also had his own stories. And my grandmother, Annie, was his hype man, so to speak. So we would be sitting around on the farm where I grew up in Louisiana. And she, she would say, here it is about that one time with the pencil and then he would tell you <laughs> that story and you know she would laugh and then the rest of us would laugh and my brother um was quite a ham and he would fall on the floor laughing and I would look around at the audience that that commanded and I thought even as a kid when I grow up I want to be able to command a room in the way that my grandfather can. And so um, it was obvious that words was the way to do, do that. And so I had to start being more observant of my life. And I had a diary that I would take with me everywhere and I would take notes. And if I heard a funny story, I would write down notes about that so I could relay that to my grandfather. And he then became my hype man because, you know, at, at big family dinners, he would say, oh, I want to have a funny story about something that happened on the bus. Tell him about that story. And so it just kind of became um, the path of least resistance was to be a storyteller in a family that really valued the word. That is so interesting i um it's so interesting the kind of uh, enthusiasm grandfathers give with storytelling uh the first monologue i ever wrote um i just kind of tried to transcribe who uh, i thought was my um, biological grandfather that came to me in a dream and i wrote down what he said um and then i performed it for the theater class the next day um so it's interesting the role like grandfathers have Right. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. So I have this page of, um, um, as Camille Dungy, the poet Camille Dungy was one of my first um, poetry writing teachers. And she would encourage us to write down anything um, that came to you ever and never to discount a word that popped into your head or a dream that you had or a line that came to you in conversation, pause and, and write that thing down. And so in preparation for our time together today, I was watching videos of some of my pieces for the, the stage and then reading the gorgeous manuscript from your latest work, uh, Cinder. But what brought me to, uh, brought me to you years ago was at the height of the pandemic when you did um, Missing Mississippi Moons. And I think um, it was one of the fine theater things that was available online. And who, what, where was it being performed at the time? Do you remember? Open Eye Theater. It was filmed at Open Eye Theater with Combustible Theater Company who produced it. Well, it was a really gorgeous piece. 
Um, and maybe if we're nice, he might read from it tonight. I don't, I don't know if he's, if he's prepared to do that, but I remember you saying in that work, it was a grandfather conjuring, right? It was, a um, going back to Southern roots, uh, conjuring up our own family stories surrounded by all of the other wildness that is the world that we live in. And that was what drew me, I think, to your own work. As a confirmed Northerner, I struggle with how much of my energy and dreams and efforts are consumed by my Southern roots. Um, but I just gotta be honest, I think Southerners are better storytellers than, than Northerners in general. I think um, we take more time. And in the North, time is more precious because if you stay outside for more than a couple of minutes when it's minus 30, you know, it's just not going to be worth, <laughs> it's not worth hearing the story to stay outside and get frostbite. So, so Southerners give these things a little bit more time. I wanted to... Um, talk to you about the obvious things for today, um, writing, a, writing about Blackness, um, writing about legacy, um, writing about history, and writing for the stage. But I also wanted to say that um, in our works, there are a surprising number of common threads. And so in true Camille Dungy fashion, as I was reading your work, I was writing down all of these notes. And one of the things that came to me was the presence of water and nature in your work. Um, in your introduction, um, Carolyn talked about um, Santa Ria traditions and about Yoruba deity traditions. And I um, have some of those same religious practices in my ancestral family history as well, but they were always unspoken. And so as a writer, it became really important to me to put the different religious practices that my ancestors had on equal footing and not have a single one be kind of bigger than the other one. But and and there's so there's religion, there's place, there's legacy, there's blackness, there's history, um, there's belonging and not belonging, there's um, fighting, sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically, to be recognized and acknowledged, which is one of the things that I found that was particularly important. I think when I was looking at the cinder brothers and the the struggles that they were having um gender but then the absolute thing that connects our work so intimately is the consistency of grief and so i wanted to talk to you about that because even when it's not spoken in your work and my work it is a key part of what draws us there. And I wonder if you'd be willing to talk some about that grief that comes through in your work and where it comes from and um, why you decide to share it with the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, once, you know, we had our conversation uh, yesterday and I learned more of the backstory behind your piece at Pillsbury House during the Naked Stages Fellowship. Um, grief, you know, just kind of was at the cornerstone of what I was resonating with as well. And I think um, grief for me, um, it's, I think in all art, it's, it's very compelling when you see someone wrestling with themselves in real time. And I think solo performance kind of allows you to do that. Um, when you when you are actually uh, trying to figure out a problem or solve a problem or pose a question um, in a communal sense because you don't really have the answer. And I think uh, grief is one of those circumstances that we find ourselves in when we try to kind of figure out what is happening and why it's happening. Um, and kind of the epic, um, 
moments in our lives that grief provides, it's like you need answers in those moments. Um, one of my favorite writers, uh, and I'm at Penumbra, so maybe it's fitting that I say this, is August Wilson. <laughs> and he says, you know, um, you know, uh, in a poem for his grandfather is the title. He says, um, it's like he has a scream stuck in his throat. And I think that's kind of uh, what grief is. It's like you have this like scream. Um, and and I, no I recognized it in your piece as well. Uh, that's kind of like um, bubbling at the surface. Um, so yeah, grief, it's like, I write about grief because it's like, I need to uh, investigate um, my journey and my, the events that's happened in my life, um, which kind of roots it in the uh, magic as well, because some grief stories are so hard to tell. It's like, how can you say it? <laughs> and uh, magic kind of helps with that. Um, yeah, what, what, uh, what for you kind of helps you when you tell these grief stories, uh, what kind of, is magic the thing for you? What kind of allows you the audacity to kind of speak it to strangers? Mm. <laughs> wow. Um, so first of all, I want to go back to your sleight of hand comment, right? Magic and sleight of hand and that. Um, so for me, um, and, and you mentioned that we had had, we had this conversation offline from the rest of the world, but since we have people here, we should catch them up. Um, so hydrosphobia, which was performed as a part of my Naked Stages Fellowship, because Antonio and I were both Naked Stages Fellows um, at Pillsbury House at different times, was a piece that was inspired by my own loss of my six-year-old son, who went to the birthday party of his best friend and drowned. And so for at least 24 hours after hearing this news, I could not speak. And so in some ways, the raw sleight of hand that needed to go was to take what was in my mind but wouldn't come out of my mouth and use a pen and paper and try to write it down. And my mother was the person who came into the darkened room and gave me a notebook and a pencil, try, had tried talking to me, I couldn't say anything. And she said, write it down, baby, write it down. And I can remember to this day what I wrote down. It was not much. It was the sentence, I wish it would have rained. And that was all my brain could come up with. It was trying to work different scenarios under which the party would have been canceled, under which they wouldn't have been swimming, under which the accident wouldn't have happened. And I think the sleight of hand that comes becomes necessary when you're trying to write what you could never say to someone else is, um, one of the many ways that grief can manifest itself. So, I mean, grief can manifest itself in terrible, you know, really painful ways like substance abuse, like um, alcoholism, like, like serious depression, like um, going to harm someone else because what have they did, what they did to someone you love. But grief can also manifest itself in some remarkably positive ways. And that is sharing your story so that someone else feels safe in sharing theirs. And I think for me in Hydro's phobia, I, I couldn't bear all because my husband and daughter would suffer as a result of sharing the whole story. But I could share bits and pieces of it and fold it over onto itself. And as a social practice artist, it was important to me that this wasn't just a retelling of the story, but this was a liberation of the audience as well, so that they would feel safe in sharing their stories about grief. And what's strange is that when I was doing it, 
of course I knew grief was a part of it. But after I had finished that, I went back and looked at other parts of my practice and realized it had always been about grief. And I'd never realized that. One of the reasons why I'm so compelled to keep going back to Rondo and keep on doing work in Rondo is because of grief. One of the reasons why I began to study African languages as a college student wasn't just curiosity. It was a way of dealing with my grief of not knowing what my ancestral African languages would have been. And so, so much of the decisions that I make, ergo I'm assuming that others make as well, are in fact rooted in grief, but we never acknowledge how much of that is grief laden. I want you to read something. Would you read something for us? Uh, sure, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> it would have been awkward if you said no, but. <laughs> like, nah, I'm good. Um, no, sure. <laughs> um, what I, would you uh, like to share? Yeah, I, um, I have one piece that I just had in mind um, to share, which is um, from my latest solo performance piece. Uh, the senders of that's cool. Um, that's great. Cool. It's an excerpt, um, uh, a monologue uh, that happens uh, kind of towards the end. Uh, and just for some context, um, it's a brother speaking to his brother. Uh, a moment of grief just happened prior, um, and he's trying to figure out what um, happened, what's happening. So. <clears throat> The map's gone. The moon gonna come back though. You say light from the moon's magic make your palm map glow. We needed to come back too. We lost, bro. We lost. Last I remember before the waves grew big was we was between sleep and wake somewhere near the crossroads walking i was tired could barely stand you were stressing like you always be some about food money or the mermaid singing and as we were walking in the dark forest this wave come. Nothing like them bayou waters, more like the sea pouring to the trees. I was shouting for you. You were screaming, hold your hand to the sky, hold your hand to the sky. And when I did, a moonbeam blessed me like a lightning strike. My palm began to glow. I followed my own roadmap to the surface of the water, swam the shore. The map faded. I ain't in the water no more, but sometimes it still feels like I'm drowning. The moon gonna come back though. And when it do, we gonna find our way back to each other. We gonna find our way, even if you just a ghost. So that's from the senders. <laughs> even if you just a ghost. So when I read that line, I actually gasped. <laughs> I really, I really did. Okay, so we got to do the, we got to do the, the applause um, for that. So it is, your words leap off the page um, when I'm reading them, but when I hear them in your voice, they become uh, three-dimensional. They become mm. really beautiful and um and so it's really captivating. And so in Cinders, not only are, are these brothers, but aren't they twins as well in the story? That, that is a I good I question. I thought I saw a line of that in there. Are, they're not, or they might be, but are we not? might know? be. Um, I am a twin, so maybe subconsciously I was conjuring my brother. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, they can be. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so the reason I ask about twins is because that's its own set of magic, right? Mm. Um, you know, sleight of hand, changing clothes, tricking teachers, doing all of those sort of kind of things. Um, 
you got a built-in understudy if they bother to rehearse the lines with you at home, all of that. Now, I always wanted a twin to the point of where I had two pictures of myself in my wallet and I would tell gullible people that this is me, but this is my wow. twin, see? <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, but I'm curious about, um, so I'm obsessed with my, grandfather because of his amazing storytelling skills and as a woman that puts me in an awkward position right because I'm not um even as a child I was told well you can't do everything that he does because you're a girl and he's a boy and back during the days of binary existence around gender and gender roles especially in Louisiana on a family farm. And so I was just really curious about um, if the creation of the Cinder brothers, Cinder being their last name, um, as opposed to a single character like in Missing Mississippi Moons is its own kind of sleight of hand because rather than having one person who is struggling alone, this person is, um, the one brother seems to actually be keeping it together because his brother is falling apart and he's trying to do everything he can to kind of rescue that, which in some ways is like two parts of oneself kind of battling. I, I must have read the twin into it, but I thought there was a single line in there somewhere that said something about them being twins. And I thought how, um, because there's a scene where, um, is it Donovan? Who, mm -hmm. um, Donovan says, because they had been placed in foster care, mm -hmm. he had never seen anyone who looked like him other than his brother. And so he sees his mother and um, is stunned that another human being could look so much like him. And if you think about this, the fo foster care, adoption, childbirth, and all of their own ways, those are all magic tricks. Those are all mm. slight of hands. Because one minute, your belly's round, the next minute it's not. And then there's like a wiggling, squirming human being. That's its own form of magic, right? Um, one minute there's a family, the next minute the government says, nah. <laughs> <laughs> that's its own mm -hmm. form of sleight yeah. of hand. And so um, that's that and that and that story, I can see your magic coming through because you keep shifting the place. And, and it keeps the viewer um, struggling to know what is reality, right? They're, they're in a garden or they're in a hospital or they're in a prison or they're here or they're there. And so I wanted to talk to you about the why of that and the weaving um, and that, is that a part of your magic practice or is that something else? Mm. That's such a good question. Um... So big questions, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, so the shifting, the shifting. Um, in my early 20s, I found myself in a circumstance where I was surrounded by a reality that was always shifting. Um, I was in a uh, position where I was caring for someone who would dramatically shift and I observed their behavior. And it was its own kind of magic to watch uh, someone you, you care for create a reality um, of their own making and then just shift it completely and it vanish. Um, and I think that's kind of a through line in my uh, writing. Um, you know, a basic sleight of hand trick is, you know, you pass one coin to the other and it disappears. And uh, I took that kind of motif and kind of thematically talked about it um, in the cinders where it's like, um, whether it be, you know, like 
in a single night, these brothers, you know, have family members vanish or reality vanish or, um, you know, their own inventions that they make. Um, the why is kind of just kind of going off of that kind of um, comedic also uh, trope of, you know, uh, creating one thing and then having it disappear the next. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with this kind of tragic comedy. Um, uh, you know, one of my favorite plays is Waiting for Godot and like that kind of um, tragic kind of um, vagabond ghost story of uh, mundane, mundane, colloquial, linguistic um, nonsense that also has this edge of like, um, comedy to it, which I also re re recognized in your piece as well. It seems like you created this like liminal space, um, especially in the beginning when you like kind of had the audience stand and say, um, I believe like, tell someone you're happy to be here. And you know, we're kind of in between worlds, it seems like, um, which is something that was very compelling to me. Um, for you, what what made you want to set it in that kind of, or if it is set in that kind of liminal space, like that kind of existential space, why that for you? Uh, because I knew, so I knew the story was gonna be hard. So first of all, I've already said, I lost my child to water. And the title character's name is Hydro, which is, of course, you know, Greek and Latin for, for water. But then you add phobia onto it. And the lead character, though her name is Hydro, is afraid of water as well. And so um, I wanted to be a caregiver for the audience in the way that so many friends and family and clergy and strangers and grief support groups were for me. But Naked Stages, there were three of us, the amazing Make Kubat and the downright magical Queen Drea um, composer. And, and so I only had about, you know, technically 30 minutes, but when I looked at the tape, it was more like 43 and seven seconds. Um, so I couldn't do the full production. So there, I, I, I wrote, as I was mentioning, I wrote like a Bible for each one of the characters. So I know all their backstories, though those, those stories don't appear on the stage. And I wanted a way for the audience to feel like, um, they weren't just watching a show on a stage. They were witnessing a story being told about someone that they cared about, that they knew about. And so the line that um, that the minister figure who um, we later discover is Patata comes onto the stage and, set, and calls everyone beautiful and then asks them to turn to someone and say, I'm so glad you're here and then turn to someone else and tell them, I am also glad that you are here. And then together we recite this um, sort of poetic responsive reading that basically means we're all in this together. And so that was my way, I think of grounding the viewers in, on what was going to be, frankly, about five or six different characters, all played by me, that were going to be coming out onto the stage and doing all these things that they weren't quite going to understand. And it was my way, I think, of trying to say, that's going to be okay. We're going on this ride together. And maybe I should read, um, you asked me about um, the passage, there's a passage that, um, so Hydro is so grief stricken and overwhelmed at the loss of her son that in the entire place, she never speaks. Her story is told through a variety of other characters. And one of those characters I call the tour guide. And she is very, um, 
perky and energetic and is doing her best with with what is it's not a happy story but the tour guide is telling it in the same way you know that if you go to the go to Gettysburg or um to South Carolina to the slave market or something someone has to tell you an interesting fact about that right and they can't just get overwhelmed with the horror of the place. And so I, I'm going to read for you, um, for the audience, a, a short passage um, from the tour guide's narrative when she's sharing with the audience. And I think maybe this will help people to sort of see why uh, the pieces all fold together. And I, and I want you to know that there's going to be some, uh, you were talking about comic relief, liminal spaces. Where on earth is this tour guide? What is she? She's essentially giving us a tour of this, this character's life, right, in some ways. But um, I felt like there needed to be some disruption of the story. And so you will hear um, these moments where other voices pop in and they're critiquing the, um, <laughs> the uh, tour guides telling of the story. So I'm gonna just read that line, here we go. <clears throat> a woman with copper colored skin and a debilitating phobia sits on a stage, stands on a stage, sits on a stage, stands on a stage. Don't piss me off. I'm running this. Dressed entirely in yellow a color she would not have previously worn due to its garish nature. But since the d loss of her son, she has discovered in his journal that yellow was his favorite color. Now she's surrounds herself with yellow things and rises each morning, dressing her body completely in yellow from head to toe. Beside the woman is a goddess. I did not write this. The goddess sends things to the woman. The goddess tells the woman that her fear of water is irrational because the woman's name is Hydro. To be afraid of it is to be afraid of herself. And this will not do. The woman is afraid. The woman knows that no one else can see the goddess. So the woman is very afraid. As a result of her fear, she flees, but not the normal type of departure. She flees into her dreams. She flees into her dreams. That um, was very moving. I've, I've, uh, what's really coming up for me is the kind of uh, antithesis between the like grief and uh, rage and then like your vocal choice um and that kind of having to it it's kind of the cornerstone of grief it's like having to um be very performative in moments of uh grief you know um uh yeah it's it's like you were playing the color yellow in your voice and um uh, while the uh, grief was um erupting which was very striking dang you're good you ought to be a critic 
<laughs> or at the very least a coach, right? So you're working with the Ife Lab folks, which I think is pretty amazing work. And I think about how fortunate they are to have you there with them helping. And so would you pause for just a moment from our story and just tell people about the Ife Lab work? Just a little. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um... So the Ife Lab is a 12-week fellowship highlighting uh, three Black solo performing artists. Um, and we commissioned them to write two uh, new solo performance pieces. Uh, one uh, five-minute piece, a uh, digital theater piece, which we'll film in a place of their choosing that kind of represents home for them. And then another 10-minute piece to perform live at a showcase at a Twin Cities venue. And then we're going to interweave these kind of digital theater pieces and live performance pieces into an Afrofuturistic um, showcase. Yeah, so so pretty amazing. <laughs> I just think it's a lovely program. This is at Penumbra, but it's also in it's happening in some other theater spaces. Right? Yeah, so officially it's not uh, linked with uh, Penumbra, but it is. Okay. Um, uh, a Black Ensemble Productions uh, creation uh, that happened at Red Eye Theater in March. Uh, and we got a grant to do it again. So we're going to do it again. So uh, be out on the lookout. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so um, Ife, Ife is the name of a, um, a tribe in, yeah. in West Africa, right? And then in your work, you're talking about Yoruba deities and spirituality and Santeria, but you don't say nothing about voodoo in there. And I'm a Louisiana girl, so it was about voodoo. So I wanna um I wanna talk to you about, about um African spirituality, African um languages, culture, and symbolism in your work. Uh because I'm really curious about that. And did that come first to you from experiencing other works that had that in there? Did it come from friends and um, famous? How did, how did it come to you? Hmm. Um, well, uh, just to be transparent, uh, sometimes it's very hard for me to speak. I have a lot of trauma around speaking. Um, I, I have a speech impediment, so sometimes I literally cannot speak. Uh, even though I'm an actor. Strange career choice. <laughs> um, but here I am. Um, but sometimes kind of the magic of theater allows me to kind of have these kind of emotional kind of uh, moments and I can speak. Um, and I didn't know how to explain it. Still though, it's kind of a mystery. So I equate it to magic. <laughs> Harping on, I feel like I'm a preacher preaching. Um, but uh, yeah, so kind of uh, black magic the most kind of correlation that I can associate it with is like voodoo or Santeria. Um, and it kind of just made sense for me because in my research around these kind of Afrocentric spiritualities, um, a deity enters and much like a character. So I was like, that kind of makes sense. Um, when I'm in character, I can, uh, the words kind of come which I found really interesting in your work too, because you kind of put on this yellow, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, cloth, this uh, clothing, and you kind of step into a deity, which allows you uh, to kind of tell your story. So I thought that was such an interesting correlation about um, grief stories being so hard to say that we need kind of the, the divine to come in uh, to allow us to tell our story. Um, was that kind of the, um, necessity for you to have that kind of uh, Afrocentric um, starting point um, to allow you to speak uh, the, the story? Well, you know, for me, it was really strange because that goddess character in particular was actually based on my real experiences after my son died. Um, after he died, I kept having these dreams where this beautiful black woman was coming to me and she was telling me all kinds of things. And um, I know a, a lot of um, 
Nigerian people in particular. And so in, in, in my dreams, she had this Nigerian accent. Um, and she was often in or near bodies of water. And she was telling me things like she had been trying to warn me for my entire life, my mother's entire life, and my grandmother's entire life that my son was going to die. But we were not seeing the signs. And I happened to mention this to Amake Kubat, who um, was also in the Givens Fellowship Program, and we had become friends and were writing together. And she said, Nigerian accent, always near a river and water, telling you these, these stories about intergenerational trauma and birth. And she said, that sounds a lot like uh, Yamoja, is that um, who that is? And I was like, I have no idea who that is. So then she gives me this, this book of um, Yoruba deities. And I discover that, well, it takes me back to, what was his name? Who did the brother sister triptych? And it was, uh, um, tapped, um, Terrell Al Alvin. yeah, um, Terrell Alvin. Yes. Um, and how he gave every single character, uh, Yoruba deity's name and they embodied these sort of things. And so, um, I had promised myself when I saw that, that I was going to go and read and study about these deities, but I never did. And so it's fascinating how some years later, in, in grief after a period where I couldn't speak at all, an African deity is coming to me in my dreams because my my life growing up in Shreveport, Louisiana was about as far from Africanness as it could be on the, on the surface. So um, of course I thought I was losing my mind because she wouldn't stop coming to me in the dreams. And so in the daytime, I got to the point where I was drinking coffee all day because I couldn't sleep at night because I was trying to avoid having more of these dreams because I was sick of her telling me that I and my mother and my grandmother had all missed the signs. And I, I remember finally getting up enough courage to say to her in a dream, well, did you ever stop to think that maybe your signs just weren't very good? <laughs> Right. So um, so that sort of challenging of the deity um, is a, a West African deity as a much more understandable, relatable sort of religious figure than my Southern Baptist upbringing. I would have never thought to argue with the, you know, our father who art in heaven. Um, and Jesus and my upbringing was such a figure that one would never argue with him because it was always about a parable or um, he was so kind and benevolent that one would never argue with him. But this deity was sassy and argued back. And so in the, um, in, in the performance of Hydro's Phobia, it, that is why she, the deity is arguing with the um, uh, tour guide. So she's telling the tour guide, I did not write that. And she's telling the tour guide that I think you should be sitting on the stage, but the tour guide is standing. So they're arguing, right? This is a um, uh, much more human um, deity filled with the types of things that might make her more of a friend to you um, or a, a grandmother or an auntie or something than this unapproachable deity who we just are manipulated by and have no control over the, the kinds of choices that they make. And so I fell for a very long time into reading about deities and other faith traditions and other cultures and how much I realized of voodoo, which was practiced in Louisiana where I grew up even by 
um, some of my ancestors, was related to the West African religious practices. No one had ever explained that to me. They just said, stay away from it. It's it's not Christian, it's bad. And so if this is a truth telling session that's happening on the stage, it was also a moment I felt was really important to write the narrative in particular for people of West African descent who now live in America that one religion is not superior to the other and that you should be looking for the signs from all the deities of all the faiths and traditions to find the ones that are speaking to you. Yeah, for Sorry. sure. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, I resonate with that so strongly. Um, you know, being a transracial adoptee and not having any kind of uh, concrete, um, ostensibly concrete connection to uh, folks who look like me and then writing down words that honestly, I don't really understand. Um, uh, or a culture that kind of, because like when I wrote Missing Mississippi Moons, um, I was writing uh, obviously about uh, Mississippi, um, but I've never been, I still haven't been to Mississippi. Um, but uh, someone from Mississippi, who grew up in Mississippi, saw that show and was spellbounded at the fact that I've never been. Um, and it just goes back to what you were saying about um, trying to, I think, ask why and trying to understand uh, uh, your um, ancestry and trying to kind of grapple with these um, uh, big questions. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something that um, I'm curious about um, in your work, uh, is uh, your relationship uh, to geography in your community? And if you could just speak uh, about that. Well, just like in your story, there's there's sleight of hand and we're not exactly sure the locale that the story is taking place in or, or it keeps sort of kind of changing. Um, I think about telling my family's story and how much of it is geography specific, right? Um, that three times great grandfather who came from Ireland and then married that three times great grandmother who was enslaved on a plantation just a few years before they were married pulls into my story some in places that I knew nothing about. I know nothing about what it was like to be enslaved and on, um, didn't even know geographically where in the place that I had grown up, there were actual plantations where people were enslaved and discovered that a place that I had been drawn to, to go on walks as a young adult had formerly been a plantation. And it completely blew my mind. And I thought about how this complicated question of how we try to erase um, you know, painful things. And it's a raging debate with like the with the Civil War monuments, right? Do we keep them and put a giant plaque up that says, we don't believe this is he's a hero anymore? Or do we knock it down and then just put up a a picture of B.B. Um, King playing a guitar or, you know, some modern hero, something else. Um, for me, place is not neutral and it never, ever has been. I was raised in Louisiana on a farm that was built on in a river basin clay soil. And people who are raised in clay soil take on the attributes of that landscape. They use it for beautification. They use it for making plates that they eat on. They 
eat it when they're pregnant and get more iron. They do all of these sorts of things. The um, place is not neutral. It never is. And the attributes of place are not neutral. If you don't believe that, ask people in um, Flint, Michigan, if place is neutral, right? About their water supply. So in my work here in the Twin Cities, as a social practice artist, I'm always trying to get people to claim their own stories, claim their own landscapes and claim their own communities and be really curious about what it means to be a St. Paulite, what it means to live in St. Anthony Park versus Frogtown. What, what does it mean and what does the geographic landscape that we walk past every day mean and how does it impact the way that we think and the way that we live, the languages we believe are acceptable or unacceptable, the cultures or traditions. And so um, in the slideshow, there were some images from a project that I did with my friends, um, photographer Chris Scott, born and raised in Rondo, and um, poet uh, Clarence Waite born and mostly raised in uh, like the St. Cloud area, but would come to the Twin Cities, to Rondo once a month to get his hair cut as a child because there was no one who could cut his hair up north. Um, she, she wanted to do portraits of a lot of the elders in the Rondo community because they were aging and passing away at an alarming rate. And I said, I'll come with you and I want to write a poem for every last one of those people. And so we, she, um, Chris, Chris and Clarence and I did this project. And I think there were about 37 portraits that she did in total. And Clarence and I took turns writing a poem for each one of those people. Um, and then the printed them onto lawn signs and installed all them in, in MLK Park with these little um, solar lights on them so people could walk, walk down this promenade and read those stories all night during the Northern Spark Festival. Because I come from a working people and I realize that the luxury of seeing art in the daytime is not always available to everybody. So why would you tell Rondo's story someplace else before you tell it in Rondo? It just doesn't make sense. And in the same way, at the height of the pandemic, um, I tackle my um, uh, Hamlin Midway neighborhood, which had had a pharmacy burned to the ground, which where I had found um, incendiary devices hidden in bushes by white supremacists who were organizing at the park that was just four blocks from my house um, to talk about love for each other and for a community. And so we did this kind of crowdsourced love poem where everybody would send me what they loved about the neighborhood. And then I created this hundred line poem and printed every single line onto its own sign and then signed up a hundred people and businesses to host one of the signs in their front yard. So then you could walk around for six months and each one was numbered so you could read it in order or out of order. Um, there was a map so you could find out where every line was because place is not neutral. And if we continue to pretend that place is neutral, it is the thing that will destroy us. It is such a critical part of who we are that we need to start acknowledging it and claiming it in some important ways. Now, I saw that Nia slipped into the, um, to me, uh, we wanna leave some time for people to do some Q and A. I wanna invite you if you wanna do um, one last reading before we go into that time, or if you just wanna keep talking, you tell me what feels comfortable for you. That's, I don't have a script, uh, another uh, one of my oh. excerpts. Well, then I guess um, you're not going to read nothing else then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go to my computer and find it. But um, <laughs> So that is amazing because that just feels like an opportunity for me to inch on in on your script and just like 
hint around about one special thing. And that is that you say you are an actor and a playwright, but in the invisible notes that the audience doesn't see in your work, there are some gorgeous poetic lines. And I tried to persuade you to read some of those just because you know my work came from this place of poetry. And while your work is rooted in memory and performance for the stage, I just thought the audience should see. So when your chat book comes out, they'll know <laughs> um, what they're getting their hands on. And so with your permission, I might just ease on in and just read one of these little um, notes. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read one <laughs> from the senders. Um, it says, they begin to climb the mountain. It's a hard journey with many rough roads. There are pathways that lead to dead ends and ostensibly dead ends that lead to pathways. Time passes, the winds howl, the rain comes, the snow falls. The brothers have exhausted themselves and find a spot on the mountain to rest. The brothers be. Thank you for reading that. Um, I haven't heard that out loud actually ever. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, that was kind of a way to just, just, just again, to talk about grief. It's like a labyrinth um, and you kind of try to figure your way out of it. Um, and there's many kind of illusions to uh, your way out. Um, so yeah, that's what the, the kind of the impulse to write that was. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I want to close with just a, um, before we start taking questions, I want to read a little excerpt I think you'd ask me about. So in the play, the um, Freeway Stories, mm -hmm. it's it was created from conversations with many, many people over several months, just asking them to share a freeway story with me at the Rondo Library and at the Rondo Center for Diverse Expression. And I want to read a monologue. It's just a few lines long from one of the characters. Um, the teens are in a program at the rec center where the, the goal is to get people to document their freeway stories. And um, the leader, Mr. Mann, turns to the um, building supervisor, Miss Lady, and asks her if she has a freeway story. And she says, I mean, we are in old Rondo. This neighborhood is just a big old ball of freeway stories. Which one do you want to hear today? I can tell you about my neighbor whose granddaddy refused to sell his property when the government was taking everybody's land through eminent domain to build the freeway. Or I can tell you about the time I was so scared when the sheriff came to put him off of his land and we watched as they forced him out. We were all worried he was gonna get hurt or even killed. I could tell you about how the government tore our community apart to build a freeway because obviously they didn't think we mattered. We're just black people trying to live our lives after all. I could tell you about how my friend's house was burned to the ground by the fire department, her practice, and how her mother and father watched their house being burned down and cried because it was a beautiful house and because they knew with the unfair settlement they had been given by the government, they could never afford to rebuild anything as beautiful as that. I've got a lot of freeway stories. But I'm sure you ladies have heard all of them in school already, right? So I'll stop there. Oh my goodness. Wow. Powerful conversation. Big conversation. Huge questions. Oh my goodness. 
Antonio, I can't wait to see your chat book that you ain't even thinking about until she started reading your notes, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> thank you both so much. And we already have one question in the chat um, from Donna. And also if anyone wants to just, you know, turn on your video and ask a question out loud, that should be fine too. But Donna would like to know more about Antonio's portrayal of John Lewis and the details of the show. Um, yeah, so uh, the episode is called uh, Bloody Sunday and it's available on the History Channel's uh, website. Um, it's in a series called I Was There. Um, it tackles uh, when uh, John Lewis uh, went to Selma and when he crossed the bridge um it kind of focuses on that um uh part of his life um and it was a very um uh, intense uh, uh experience but it was uh uh good i think it uh, turned out pretty good <laughs> all right other questions or comments Some stories are so hard to tell that we sometimes need a deity to come in and help us. Wow, that's really powerful. And it sounds, it reminds me of something that Octavia Butler said, which is sometimes writing about a thing makes it easier to stand. Could you all just sort of speak to that just a little bit while um, we're uh, seeing if any other questions come in? You already have really, but um, yeah. Yeah, so since um, Antonio, since you talked about um, transracial adoption, mm -hmm. are the, and, and Cinder, are the, and Cinders, are the brothers transracially adopted in that story or we do, oh, we do know that, yes. Mm -hmm. Because they say that the foster parents could barely stand them mm -hmm. and they're not as it as it were i'm paraphrasing but yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah and, and carolyn an interesting thing about that is dealing with the trauma after the loss of, of my son and my mother handing me the notepad mm -hmm. i would sometimes um not be able to get out of bed after that and i met discovered the magic of writing if i sat down and wrote anything in my journal i could get up i could go out into the world i could navigate the place and so um, I guess I didn't know that line by Octavia Butler, but uh, she was spot on with that. Yeah. And your your mother knew it somehow from somewhere, because what does she say? Write it down, baby. Write it down. I just want to reiterate that to everyone that's in this room right now. Write it down. Write it down, baby. <laughs> mm. Any other questions or comments? And Kia wants to make sure that everyone completes the survey that uh, she put in the chat. It's uh, really important for us to know what you think of these conversations that we are having together. I was really struck by, oh, good, here comes, let's see, from Rick. Thank you for an insightful conversation. I'm also a writer, and I wonder if when you write about grief, is it difficult to write about anything else? It seems that when you go deep on core grief, it's difficult to write about anything else. Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, grief can consume you. I think um, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, I forget how the saying goes, like the forest from the trees or the trees from the forest. It's kind of hard to um, see anything else. It's kind of blinding in that way, but um, I think once you do, uh, you kind of can see the world again. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a strange thing. It's kind of like a cleansing, um, cathartic thing. Um, but yeah, so I would say, yeah, it is difficult to write about something else in the moment of it. Mm -hmm. And Kia and I both had the same thought as she wrote it in the, in the um, chat there, where you said grief is a scream that gets stuck in your throat. That is so deep and so powerful and so true and so real. 
And then Hawana, I think you also talked about the, the, the other side of grief, the positive side of grief. Did um, I don't know if you went to the installation that, um, uh, why am I blanking on her name? I'm looking at this woman's face and I can't think of her name. That's horrible. That she had us um, just walk in one by one and just sit there for a while and think about the other side of grief. What is on the other side of grief? Hmm. Where and was it? Hmm? Where was it? It was at the, in the 7-Eleven building. Marae, Marae Regulus. Oh, so, yeah. I, yeah. I yeah. went, went to well see that. That was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was amazing the the one by one the chance to process the um I haven't written a poem in years but that that sort of inspired a poem and I wrote a poem I can't believe I did it. <laughs> so you know, Carolyn, one thing I would say to Rick is um, I, I would pose this question to him in beautiful Socrat Socratic you know Socratic format mm -hmm. is who is to say that everything is not grief. Mm -hmm. Who is to say that? Even um, joy um, and the excitement that we feel when we experience the bringing of new life into the world is so joy-filled because it's compared to the sorrow of the other thing. And I mean, I grew up in Louisiana and in the Southern part of the state, we still to this day employ people um, um, as professional grievers at funerals, not just because we want people to think that person will be missed so much that you know we should carry on and fall out and carry on so terribly. But also because sometimes we don't think it's safe to share our grief until someone else takes the lead and, and kind of shows us how. And so, you know, if you don't believe me ask uh, the tortured poets society taylor swift you know all of those breakup poems are are their are their own kind of grief and even when we find someone that we love sometimes there is grief in that because we didn't find them sooner and so i think it's okay to operate from a place of grief don't let grief run you but don't pretend that grief is not as much a part of us as breathing and air and blood is because it is. Juana Mark also says, let's see. Hello. <laughs> Betty thinks your grandfather would be proud of your storytelling. <laughs> yeah. I really love that you, where you guys went with this conversation into the magic and into the deities and into the ways that they, that they are always with us. I'm just so, I, uh, Antonio, like you, I'm speechless <laughs> right now. So are there any other questions or comments before we say good night? Please fill out the uh, the survey that Kia put into the chat. And I guess people are hanging on. Do you have any final thing, anything that you'd like to say as one last thought for both of you? Um, I don't know if this is possible for folks who, oh, I'm hoping that they're filling out the thing, but I would love to share the link so that they could watch the performances that we referenced here for, you can watch them for free um, online. And so I'd be happy to share those links if if there's a way to share that back with people who registered. Um, I don't know what how that would work, but um, well, because this is being recorded. So will we send a link to people afterwards sharing the recording with yes, them? We'll share the recording. Okay. <clears throat> excuse me and if you'd like we can put the links in the recording or okay. in the email that we send out with the recording and you both get one as well Thanks. yeah do you have one final thought antonio thank you for having me this was a very um inspiring conversation and i'm mm -hmm. privileged to be in y'all's company yeah same so if, yeah so if you two could stick around for a minute and um, Nia and Naja too, actually, if you guys could stick around for a minute after the program ends. Oh, there's three new messages. Oh, yay. Let's see. Yeah, just a bunch of thank yous because this is just 
It was so powerful. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I love both of your readings, too, the tour guide and the uh, hydro, what's her name? And the hydro. I'm such an introvert. I um, I'm I'm really a homebody, and I miss so many things because that introvert in me just it just takes so much to get out of the house. <laughs> but once I finally do, it's like there's so much magic out there. But that's why I'm so glad that there was this option to be able to do this online because I saw some of the people that joined us were actually joining us from other states. Mm -hmm. Some people were joining us from right here in the Twin Cities. People that are immunosuppressed or, you know, have people that they need to care for. It, it's it's wonderful for them to be able to be a part of conversations like this. So I'm so thankful for that. Absolutely agree with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming. And I guess we have reached the end of the show. Unless there are other, I don't think there are others. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Carolyn, Hawana, and Antonio. Just an amazing conversation. Thank you for sharing your stories and um, being so open and vulnerable this evening. That's what's so beautiful about these conversations, that people allow themselves to be vulnerable, as Kia pointed out, and just all this beauty comes out. So, um, OK.